On today's episode of Locked On Canucks, we continue with the country club atmosphere in Vancouver and a look at some potential free agents who could be in Vancouver come to the new season. We look back at the 2016 NHL draft and boy, oh boy, there's going to be some interesting takes about that. It's Locked On Canucks on a Tuesday and it starts now. Locked On Canucks, your daily podcast on the Vancouver Canucks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode, Tuesday, June the 14th episode of Locked On Canucks, the show that keeps you locked in on all things Vancouver Canucks. Once again, I'm your host, Justin Pooney. I hope you guys are doing well on a Tuesday. Of course, you can find me at Twitter underscore process sports. You can find our show's Twitter under sorry, not underscore at locked on Canucks on Twitter. And please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I also want to thank you all for making Locked On Canucks your first listen of the day. Every day we are free and available wherever you get your podcast services. Guys, like I mentioned, we're going to retouch on the country club atmosphere and how that potentially in- includes the leadership group. I saw in a couple of other prominent Vancouver podcasts talking about how, you know, with this country club attitude, is it time for a change uh, with the Canucks leadership core? Jim Rutherford and Patrick Alvine, how they do not owe anybody a, ex- not an explanation, but they don't owe anybody loyalty. And then we will take a look at some free agents who were reported today to potentially be linked with the Canucks. And I will let you know if, whether I think those select few players are worth it or not. Then, of course, we're going to take a look at the 2016 draft. Of course, yesterday we looked at the 2015 draft where I said Brock Besser was most likely the right decision for the Vancouver Canucks back in the 2015 draft this year. Sorry, this draft in 2016, oh, there is definitely not going to be an agreement. And then finally, I'm just going to talk on some new ways, uh, new initiatives I feel the NHL can grow its game and quite frankly become cooler because the NHL, if it wants to grow in the United States, it has to become cooler. But let's dive right into yesterday's hot button topic that we talked about where the Canucks were deemed a, or the other day, excuse me, the Canucks were deemed a country club atmosphere. And that caused a whole bunch of turmoil, not turmoil, but a whole bunch of hot button topics in Vancouver the last oh, 72 hours. Um, for those of you that didn't remember, a prominent uh, hockey reporter, Nick Kiprios reported on a podcast um, that the Canucks and Jim Rutherford, sorry, excuse me, Jim Rutherford believes the, the Mentality in the environment in the locker room is very much of a country club. And there will be some massive changes in Vancouver and that people should expect this team to look vastly different. Well, first of all, let's touch on the aspect of vast changes. Well, we knew that because there's a new regime coming in. And folks, whenever a new ownership or new management takes over a sports franchise, a company, there is going to be changes. There is going to be downsizing in certain industries. There is going to be a reshuffling of the deck. There is going to be something that allows the new management to have a better hold on the organization. And that is exactly what is transpiring here with the Vancouver Canucks. When you look at the previous regimes right, that have come in, there has been swift changes. Look back at the Jim Benning era. Ryan Kessler, gone. Kevin Bieksa played one year, but gone, right? Henrik and Danielson stayed, but they were franchise icons at that point where they owed themselves to, their Canucks owed it to them to stay. You look at the Mike Gillis era, Marcus Naslin, gone. Brendan Morrison, gone, right? Brian Burke came in, Pavel Bure, gone. You know, Pat Quinn era, there was new people brought in, fresh blood brought in that fit the style of play that those front offices wanted to play. Excuse me. Those players were brought in to fit the mold that the franchise was trying to go in. So nothing here is different. Maybe perhaps now that there's more media coverage on the team and there's more podcast people are more worried some or um, 
you know, hyped up about it and get a lot, get very antsy when they hear the word change. But guys, we knew this was going to be a process. There are some great pieces we have here, but there's going to be a lot of work. And when you look at a guy like Brock Besser, although we think he is going to stay, and Jim Rutherford said, you know, they're not going to let him walk. They're going to, uh, you know, even offer him the $7.5 million qualifying offer because they can make it work for one year. Um, you know, a guy like Brock Besser could be expendable because, you know, he wasn't drafted by this regime. He is not this guy. Same with Bruce Brudro. He is not really Patrick Alvin and Jim Rutherford's guy. Nobody here on the Canucks roster is a Rutherford or Alvin guy. They want to build this organization around the people that they're comfortable with, the people that they trust, the people that they feel will best bring a Stanley Cup to Vancouver, which is their ultimate goal and which should be their ultimate goal. So I know change and people getting attachment to players is, you know, it's a part of being a fan, but this is also a business and we're in the business of winning a Stanley Cup. And I feel that every fan would swallow their love for a certain player if it meant a Stanley Cup would finally arrive in Vancouver. Um, so I don't, th- I, I like this. I absolutely love this. I voiced it the other day, but I love the fact that, you know, these leaks and reports are coming out about vast changes because that is what is needed. A fresh coat of paint, a lift up on this franchise is needed for it to proceed forward to hopefully contend for a Stanley Cup. And as I mentioned, I think this team has the right foundation, the right building blocks to potentially be Canada's best chance of winning a Stanley Cup. That, you know, but as it's currently constant, yes, they played well under Brudro, but they didn't make the playoffs. We didn't, no, we, the Canucks did not make the playoffs last year. As well as they played under Bruce Brudro, they quit on the team I got with Travis Green. And then I saw on another prominent Vancouver podcast that a poll question was asked. Should the Canucks change their leadership group? Well, first of all, if they are talking about Bo Horvat, I don't think so because Bo Horvat was the right decision as the captain. He's the longest tenured player. He's a leader. You know, he's just coming up a career season. He's a part of that core four that we've kind of indicated or core five that, you know, Jim Rutherford and Patrick Alvin have discussed. Um, I don't see Bo Horvat going anywhere. I see him being... Um, a guy that will be with in Vancouver for as long as he wants to be in Vancouver because he's a high character individual and he produces on the ice and plays a 200 foot game. Um, other guys, you know, of course, you know, Oliver Ekman Larson wore an A. Uh, I believe Tyler Myers, Tyler Myers wore an A, and Brandon Sutter wore an A, uh, but he wasn't around. You look at it, Quinn Hughes and Elise Pedersen, for lack of a better words, are their two best players. Yes, JT Miller. Also wore an A, but JT Miller is kind of, well, he's in limbo, quite frankly. We don't know if JT Miller is going to stay. Is he going to go? What's going to happen there? So when I'm looking at the Canucks leadership core, I want to see Elias Pettersson and Quinn Hughes take that next step and take ownership of this organization. Because as, although Bo Horvat is the captain, quite frankly, those two along with that Demko are the drivers of the bus of this organization. Those three right there, will make up the spine or the backbone of this organization. You know, Thatcher Demko is as good as it can get at with a, with a number one goalie, a young number one goalie. We know how much talent Quinn Hughes has. We know how much talent Elias Pettersson has. We know what Bo Horvat does. So you have your spine right there. I want to see, you know, Quinn Hughes and Elias Pettersson become leaders, put a letter on them, give them that extra added responsibility, see what it, what if they can handle it. Right, because eventually they're they're gonna be there's gonna be a point in time when Bo Horvat is not going to be with the Vancouver Canucks. Now he's still only twenty what twenty seven, I believe. So he's still gonna be here for a while. But like I said, H- Pedersen and Hughes and Demko have to take a larger leadership role because they're no more. They're no longer just the younger guys. They are the guys on this team and in this franchise. When you go to a Canucks game, you're gonna go want to see Elias Pedersen and Quinn Hughes and Thatcher Demko. When teams play against the Canucks, they're going to want to game plan against Patterson, Hughes, and Demko. So I want to see what they can do with a leadership group, uh, with a leadership role, excuse me. If Miller stays great, keep an A on him. But OEL, I don't think so. Tyler Myers, no. 
Um, another possible can I don't well, we don't think Brandon Sutter is going to play again because of his uh, COVID issues. Um, but I want to see, yeah, I want to see the young guys in a leadership role now. I think it's time for them to take that next step and uh, amount, um, take some leadership responsibility. Um, so I don't think I you leave Bo Horvat the captain, but I think the other people with the letters now, barring a JT Miller um, move or not, if he stays, keep him with an A because we know what he brings leadership wise. But give Quinn Hughes and Elias Pedersen an A. Hell, even if Brock, if you're allowed to, give Brock Besser an A if he signs a new deal. See what these younger guys can do when they're put in a position where it's the franchise is theirs, the keys are theirs. See what it takes, or sorry, see what they have, and if they have what it takes to be leaders of a team. Last part I want to touch on is certain free agents that came out today. Uh, reports came out that the Canucks potentially could be interested in. And I touched on one of these guys before, Curtis Lazar uh, from Boston. Of course, then there was Andrew Kopp. Um, he de- he's a definite target for the Canucks. And then um, another interesting name, Ilya Mikheyev. So I, if I am Jim Rutherford and I'm Patrick Albina, I'm looking at these three players in a vacuum. First of all, let's take a look at Andrew Kopp. Andrew Kopp, of course, is 27. He was with the Winnipeg Jets for a number of years and then got traded to the Rangers at the deadline. He had 21 goals, 53 points in 72 games. In the playoffs, he had six goals and 14 points in the 20 games the Rangers played before they were eliminated in game six by the Tampa Bay Lightning. Um, I don't think Andrew Kopp will be around. Uh, the Canucks price range. I think the Rangers, you know, they gave a first round pick for him. They have enough cap space to keep him. I believe Andrew Kopp stays in New York because like I said, they did their still have a young core, a relatively cheap young core before um, they have to pay them, you know, before the Panarins and, you know, the Zabinajads and Criders, you know, get older. So currently, because it's cost I think Andrew Kopp will stay in New York. I think his playoff performance, um, made that more evident that he probably wants to stay in New York and the Rangers want to keep him. They can afford to keep him. So I don't think Andrew Kopp will be available unless the Canucks want to offer a stupid amount of money, which would not be the smart idea. Uh, Curtis Lazar, you'd probably bring him in to play that fourth line role, replace a current Ranger or potentially will be a current Ranger. Uh, Tyler Mott, um, you know, he's probably going to be in your fourth line. He's a BC kid, 27. Um, he's been, he's bounced around the league quite a bit. He only, he had 18, eight goals, excuse me, for 16 points in 17 games last year. Penalty killer will play in your bottom six. Um, if he comes on the cheap, I would like that move, but I'm more interested in Ilya Mikheyev. Ilya Mikheyev played on a Toronto Maple Leafs team, which we know quite frankly, their top six is loaded. Uh, he's 27. He, he had a decent, decent season. Um, McCabe had 21 goals and 32 points in 53 games for Toronto. Um, That would be the guy I'm kind of targeting for the Vancouver Canucks. I think McCabe could fit very well uh, with the Canucks and their, and their plan. He plays kind of that, you know, that two way game. um, And he, I, I believe he'd just be a good fit with Vancouver. They got a 20 goal score. Uh, I think he'd certainly be a better fit in Vancouver than a um, Tanner Pearson, a um, one of those wingers. I think if you're able to ship out a Tanner Pearson contract um, at the draft and you free up some space, I would definitely bring an Ilya Mikheyev in. Um, I think he could. He plays kind of a, a, a you know a sandpaper ish game. Um, he's easy on. He's not you know he's not a pushover, um, and he's got some skill to him. He can put the puck in the back of the net. Um, Again, I think Toronto's lack of um, Toronto's lack of playoff success might help the Canucks in this instance, where his price tag might not be that big. Take a run at Ilya Mikheyev. I would like to see, I know I'm not the biggest Leafs fan, but being in Toronto, watching them play quite free, I've seen Mikheyev's game, and I I respect it, and I think it in a middle six role. Um, so I'm interested in that. If the Canucks contract and free up some space. Uh, potentially that move can be made. But Curtis Lazar has a chance, probably the, out of those, those to be the high Canuck because he's got to come cheap and can fill a void bottom six. So that is that for our daily news segment. Coming up, uh, we are going to take a look at the 2016 NHL draft. In my opinion, one of the biggest busts in Canucks history. And, and it left me with a lot of what-ifs that 
the Canucks. Uh, so look, I want to talk to you guys about Built. Built, of course, you know our friends are always coming out with new amazing flavors. Built has truly outdone themselves. With, and for the first time ever, Built is introducing the new Mud Pie flavor in both, both Mud Pie Bar and Mud Pie. Not sure what Mud Pie. If you're a chocolate fan, you better sit down for this. The new Mud Pie Bar is rich with whipped cream, smothered in 100% real chocolate, and topped with cookies and cream. You've got to try Mud Pie as soon as possible, and you need to hurry because the Mud Pie mud pie Puff are only available for a limited time. Visit Built.com for yourself. Not convinced? Luckily, we've saved that it's actually good for you. No, all Built products are low cal protein and low sugar. Mud Pie 16 grams of protein, only 100 50 calories and eight. It's like your most delicious creamy chocolate mud pie and wrapped it up for you. Mud pie bars and puffs are available at built.com right now, but they're going fast because they are so delicious. A bunch. Like all, all built bars on real chocolate, that and tasty. What's great about built protein, which your body absorbs more efficiently of health benefits. Eating something tastes good for and is good for you. You're going to love the new built. The new uh, built mud pie built puff. Whether you need a snack, or you just need to grab a quick bite. It is the perfect protein bar, and they taste better than a candy bar. Chocolate mousse, whipped cream, cookies, and cream crumble. Stop drooling. Go to built.com to get your box of mud pie bars and puffs. Now you won't regret it. Once again, we have a special offer for you. Go to built.com. Use promo code locked15 to get 15% off your order. Use promo code locked15. To get 15% off your order. Also, we have a special favor to ask of all of you. We've put together a survey so we can learn more about listeners like you and make your favorite Locked On podcast even better. This is your opportunity to tell us what you like and don't like about Locked On podcasts. Go to LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey right now to get started. If you, It won't take very long. Everyone that completes a survey can qualify for a chance to win one of 10 $100 Ticketmaster gift cards. Take your audience survey. At, go to take it. Go to lockedonsports.com slash survey. Thank you for your help. So we are back once again. As I mentioned, today we are looking at the 2016 NHL entry draft and determining whether the Canucks made the right pick, especially in the first round. We'll also take a look at potential other picks they should have made that they will regret for a very long time. But a little bit of a backstory. This was the 2015-2016 season, which saw the Canucks finish second last in the Pacific Division. Of course, lovely Willie Desjardins was still the coach. They finished 29th of 30th in goals for with just 191. 24th out of 30 for goals against. And quite frankly, it was a horrible, horrible year. 31, 38, and 13. Henrik Sedin was the captain still. Henrik and Danielson were still around. They led the Canucks in scoring. Daniel had 28 goals and 33 points. Henrik had 55. Bo Horvat had 16. Yannick Hansen had 22 goals that year. Sven Berchi, Radon Verbata with their 15 and 13 respectfully. Alex Burrows was at the tail end of his career. And quite frankly, this roster looks a lot different. There was, of course, Nikita Triamkin, who played 13 games. Jacob Markstrom played only 33 games this year. Ryan Miller played 51. Remember that goaltending tandem. And of course, Hunter Shinkarik was still around. Adam Cracknell, Emerson Edom, Dan Hamhus, Lyndon Vay, Derek Dorsett, Matt Bartkowski, Jared McCann, all Alex Biega, Chris Higgins was still a Canuck at this point in time. So let's just say this feels like a very long time ago and the Canucks finished in a horrible position, giving them the f- fifth overall pick in this draft. The 2016 draft that featured the likes of first round pick, first overall, current Toronto Maple Leaf, Austin Matthews. Then we had, of course, Patrick Laine to Winnipeg, Pierre-Luc Dubois to Columbus. It's funny because those two guys swap places now. Dubois is in Winnipeg and Laine is in Columbus. Yessi Pugliarvi went to Edmonton. Of course, hasn't really panned out. Number six, Matthew Kachuk, who has become an elite, elite player. Clayton, Clayton Keller, who is now an elite player in Arizona, probably the only elite player they have. 
Mikhail Sorgachev was drafted by Montreal and I. He, of course, now is a part of the Tampa Bay Lightning and their quest for a three-peat. Um, Tyson Yost, Jacob Chikrin, another solid Arizona product in that draft. Dante Fabro uh, was also taken in that draft, the first round. Um, and then Charlie McAvoy. And then we go to the second round where a guy like Jordan Cairo was taken, Alex DeBrincat. Um, Jonathan Dolan was taken in the second round by Ottawa. Of course, we all know him, former Canuck, member of the Canuck system, Samuel Gerard. Um, you also have Philip Gustafson, Dylan Dubé, Carl Gunstrom. Um, Adam Fox was drafted by Calgary in the third round, who went on to become the Norris Trophy winner. So safe to say there is a lot of talent in this draft, but Let's go to the Canucks, who held the fifth overall pick in this NHL draft, and they decided to go to a very prominent hockey hotbed that develops a lot of great players, which where Matthew Kachuk was from, the London Knights, and Ole Ulevi, of course, the defenseman who, quite frankly, did not pan out to how the Canucks wanted him at all. Of course, he played the 2016-17 season in London, 58 games, 32 points, sorry, 32 assists for 42 points, had a decent season in London. Then he went to play in Sweden where, you know, he toiled there for a year, then played in Utica. And quite frankly, might go down as one of the biggest busts in Vancouver Canucks history. He had a good um, world junior champion, sorry, under 20 world junior champions where he had seven games played and nine assists. Um, and then after that, he kind of fell off. And I don't know what it was with Oliu Levy. Uh, I'm not too sure if it was just the pressure, um, if it was work ethic, if it was just skill, but the Canucks whiffed badly on this pick. Horribly. Now, I know they wanted to rebuild their defense because it was getting old. Guys like Dan Hamus were gone. Adler was long in the tooth. And it was time, you know, Tanev was always consistently injured. And they wanted to find a new number one pairing defenseman, which they eventually did find in Quinn Hughes, but Ole Ulevi was never the answer. And when you look back at this draft, you think about what if. What if the Canucks had taken Matthew Kachuk? Now, hindsight, if they had taken Kachuk, they might have never gotten um, Elise Pedersen the next year because they might have been a much better team. Um, but this, if, even with Matthew Kachuk, this team was not going to make the playoffs with Matthew, a young Matthew Kachuk. Clayton Keller even a Sergachev or whatever. And it just, it spoke to how the Canucks failed in developing Ole Ulevi, whether it was to their fault or his fault. It just was a bust, bust move. And I think when you look at Jim Benning's draft record, he did a lot of good, had a lot of good draft picks, but Ole Ulevi will probably go down as the biggest bust for the Vancouver Canucks. He played, currently Ole Ulevi has played 41 games in the NHL, two goals, one assist, three points, and six penalty minutes. And you compare that to a guy, if we want to take a look at the high end, we'll look at, I think, Sergachev, you know, he's played 302 ga- 362 games, has 174 points with Tampa. Even if we, we look at Charlie McAvoy, 313, right? We look at Jacob Chikrin. Jacob Chikrin. He's played three seven games, has 142 points. They've all on the back end. If they go in the back, of course, you have a guy like Matthew Kachuk taking one point after one position after 152 goals, 200, 382 points, 425 penalty minutes in 431 games. Difference maker. You see all these guys, difference makers. And that is what happened with the Vancouver Canucks. When they were drafting in those top end positions, Yes, you got the Pedersen, you got the Hughes, you got a Horvat, um, you got a Besser who was in the later first round, but only you levy, you whiffed on. Jake Vertanen, you whiffed on. And quite frankly, that's also helped set this organization back on top of the salary cap issues and the, the bad contracts because had those players like Ole Levy developed, they would never have to sign a guy like Tucker Pullman or Tyler Myers or they never had to go after an OEL because they would have had a guy in OU Levy who would have been homegrown, would have been able to handle a workload, but he was never able to develop like that. And when you look back at this draft, that was the key to, you know, bad contracts in the back end. The Canucks defense is still a mess. 
right now. And, you know, you look at old U Levy and he just never was able to develop his game. And that definitely was the wrong decision. In hindsight, you could have picked anybody, even Tyson Jost, who hasn't played. He's only played 100 some odd games. He, even he was more valuable than Ole U Levy. So, whatever Benning and company were thinking about Ole U Levy, um, for the various reasons why he failed, it was a failure and it set this organization back. And it was a part of the reason why so many bad contracts were now on um, the back end for the Vancouver Canucks and why they're in kind of a salary cap hell currently. So that is that for the 2016 draft. Coming up after this final break, we are going to take a look at some of the ways I believe the NHL must become cooler and hipper and become more one with the times, one would say. Um, So that is that because we want to see this game grow, especially down south. And welcome back to Locked on Canucks. So quickly, the last couple minutes of the show, I was listening to Colin Cowherd, a very prominent broadcaster in the United States. And he was actually mentioned hockey very briefly when he was talking about the ratings of the NBA, talking about how the NHL has a massive TV deal in two countries and yet cannot have any traction because the game is not cool. You can't market it or sell it to anybody in the States. And it's a very niche market. When you look at it, Yes, certain hockey markets in the States have great fans, but for the mainstream media, the mainstream person, the average sports fan down south, you have the NFL, which is king, the NBA, college football, college basketball, F1's taking off, right? Premier League soccer. Um, you have all these other sports and options, and then the NHL, NHL kind of slides in there somewhere. Uh, definitely a top, you know, five, maybe, um, but how would you, if I was the commissioner, this is how I would make hockey cooler. Simply, I would make my players more active on social media. Add some incentive or some league initiative to help grow the game. Make them go out in the in the public eye more. Speak, speaking engagement. Promote personality. Promote individuality. Promote who these players are. Because there are some players in the NHL who have great personalities. I love Nathan McKinnon's personality and how you know he's a straight shooter. He says what's on his mind, and he will say it, you know, how it is. That is what the NHL needs more of. Guys that, you know, will show their personality and will not just spit out the same tired cliches because that's how we get engaged. Why do we love the NBA? Because guys like Draymond Green, whether you love him or hate him, say controversial things, say what's on their mind, and create engaging topics. That's all this is all about in the media. It's all about creating engaging topics and storylines where people can create discussion and bring eyes to the sport. That is how you make this game great. Look, this NHL playoffs have been awesome. This Stanley Cup Finals is going to be great. I've heard people comparing it to the 80s Islanders and the Oilers in 1982, that Stanley Cup Finals, where you know a previous dynasty could be meeting the next up-and-coming dynasty. I don't know if I'd go that far yet, but I do believe this is going to be a great Stanley Cup Finals. You have to press while the iron is hot and make players be themselves more because you look at the other podcasts and there's other prominent podcasts out there that bring out the personalities of these nhl players that is how we grow the game personalities will sell this game and individuality will sell this game to people down south and create eyes and viewers and allow people to you know fall in love with stars and make them more relatable because right now many people think of hockey players as monotone robots that's not the case otherwise in other leagues, you want to have players fall in love, excuse me, fans fall in love with players' personalities and who they are. That is how you build eyes. So that, to me, is the biggest key on how you fix the NHL and make it cool. And I think the Canucks have some great personalities as well. And that is how the game will go down south. And potentially, the Canucks get more fans down south, which, as a Canucks member of the Canucks Army, Canucks Nation, excuse me, um, I believe it's it would be imperative. The Canucks, of course, travel well always. It was, we always welcome new fans on to the bandwagon. So that is all we have for today on Tuesday, the June the 14th. Tomorrow, we will take a look at the 2017 draft, talk about more some more Canucks news. Of course, I want to thank you for making Locked On Canucks your first listen of the day. For your second listen, Locked On NHL. Locked On NHL covers the NHL playoffs like no other. Hear the latest news and opinions from local experts every Monday through Friday. It's free and available wherever you get your podcast services. All right, guys, take care, stay safe, and we will talk to you tomorrow.